Hey there, kids. Time to get moving a little bit away from the solving of trig equations to the graphing of trig functions, just like we've been doing all year long. We look at the graphs and the transformations for them. So let's have a little look. So section 6.4 here, a uh, quick little review. Now, in the beginning of the year, we had an assignment that seems so long ago where we had 12 different graphs and you had to know what they looked like. So here, for your viewing pleasure, just a quick little recount. So here's the sine, the cosine, and the tan graphs. Um, not too much else to say other than you can see sine and cosine basically are the same shape, just kind of shifted over a little bit. And tan is the weird oddball that no one really likes. Most of what we're going to look at is focusing on the sine and the cosine graphs, um, but we do want to be aware of the tan graph as well. Okay, we have a word here. All three graphs are periodic. So the word uh, periodic just means it happens with uh, regular intervals. More on that later. Um, sine and cosine, because they have the same shape, they're actually both called sinusoidal, so there's a word just to know. So when we say sinusoidal, it's not something where your uh, nose is all plugged up. <laughs> uh, sinus jokes are funny. Um, but what it is, is it's saying something that has the characteristic, you know, up, down, up, down, up, down sort of wave shape. So that could be sine or cosine, it doesn't really matter. Tan is not sinusoidal, but it does have a lot of the same features. So again, we're mostly going to focus on the sinusoidal ones, but tan will maybe pop its ugly little head up once in a while. Okay, some key features, uh, basically just language you must know. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of words getting thrown around here. I'm gonna show you uh, some of the important ones. So a center line is a horizontal line halfway between the peak and the trough. So that would be something like here. In this example, my center line would go cut all the way through here. Okay, so that is what you might call the center line. The amplitude is the vertical distance between the center line and the peak or the trough. So the amplitude is measured as the vertical distance from here to here. The only thing that sometimes people screw up with amplitude is they want to uh, they want to do like the full range, and that's not what the amplitude is. So it's just a vertical distance. Um, nothing else to say there. Period is the horizontal distance. Now this one, I have to admit, this one actually bugs me quite a bit. I'll, I'll show it on the picture. Move my uh, beautiful face out of the way there. I'll show it on the picture, and then I'll give you a little uh, bit of an explanation of why I don't like that word here. Okay, so the period is like this distance here. Okay, this is the period. Now, as a person who likes physics, who has a physics degree, uh, what you would call the period in physics is you would actually call it the wavelength. So my little complaint about this, maybe as a physicist, um, is that in physics, a period is actually not a physical measure of the length of the wave. What the period is, is usually the time it takes. So when you have something oscillating, like something going up and down, up and down, the time it takes for two peaks to happen. So if, it, if this like goes up and down every two seconds, the period would be two seconds. However, in math, there's this tendency to call the period like an actual length. So this period is an actual distance. So the word period really uh, bothers me as a physicist and uh, just be aware that it is a horizontal distance, um, but sometimes time can also uh, indicate what it is. And to just make things a little worse, sometimes what we have when we're graphing waves, like in physics, we might put time on the x-axis, uh, which now means that period refers to a length of time and it is a physical distance on the graph because time is the x-axis. Anyway, if that's all too confusing for you, don't worry about it. Period in this course will be a horizontal distance and it is like the wavelength. Okay, then the last one is phase shift. So this is a horizontal shift from where the graph would normally start. So when I say normally start, uh, I mean the sine graph normally does this. It starts at zero, zero, and it increases, so it goes like that. So if you had a graph that was phase shifted, what you could, uh, you could have a graph that maybe is phase shifted to the right, and maybe it would do this sort of thing. So that would be a phase shift to the right. Cosine, be aware that cosine starts uh, at 0, 1, and it decreases, so this would be like for sine, and then cosine, of course, would start high and then go like that. 
And we can have phase shifts from that, and we can do same thing with tangent. Tangent, remember, starts at zero, zero, and it actually starts by going up, and then it kind of does this weird repeating thing with these vertical asymptotes in between. We don't need to know too much about the tan graph. I'm not actually going to focus on them too much, but again, I'll just be aware. Okay, now if you're looking at these things and going, isn't the phase shift kind of like a transformation? You're absolutely right, and we're going to connect the two together in just a sec here, actually. Okay, so here's a little graph. Now you don't necessarily need to, uh, I don't know, I guess you don't necessarily need to memorize this all, you just need to be aware of it. I thought it would be handy just to see sort of side by side the comparisons. So uh, we can just see like one, one period of the graph. This is one single period uh, between zero and period, there we go, between zero and two pi. Um, you can just kind of see what one period looks like, although we've kind of seen that before. Um, but mostly the point of this table is to show that the sinusoidal functions really have a lot in common and tan being the non sinusoidal one is kind of a weirdo. So sine and cosine both have an amplitude of one. Tan has an undefined amplitude because on the graph here, there actually would be arrows going up and down to infinity. So we can't really say tan has an undefined. Uh, we cannot say tan has an amplitude, it would be undefined. Um, the y-intercepts, of course, 0, 1, and 0, so sine and tan are similar in that regard. Fun fact, I think I might have mentioned this, but if I haven't, tan is sine divided by cosine. And I don't know if you know that, but there you go. That's actually pretty handy to know. So tan is sine divided by cosine, so this should make some sense. If sine has a y-intercept of 0, then if tan is uh, sine of cosine, well, when, uh, when x is 0, y is 0, which means this will be 0, which means this will be 0. So this can explain why uh, tan actually shares some of these same qualities as sine. Uh, maybe I won't actually erase that because that's pretty handy to have. So let's just keep that there. Okay, the period of each, 2 pi and 2 pi. Uh, tan has a period of pi. Uh, if you remember, we were talking about the general solutions. You always have pi k instead of 2 pi k. And again, that's because the spacing between these points here is just pi whereas the spacing between two equivalent points here is actually 2 pi. Zeros, uh, this is not something you need to memorize. And this really looks like a bunch of uh, gobbledygook, but it's just saying this, the zeros occur at any multiple pi. So this is like 0, pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, and so on. Cosine, you have to start at pi over 2, and then you add pi. So it's like pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, 5 pi over 2, and so on. And then again, for the reasons I mentioned here, because sine over cosine is tan, when sine is zero, so is tan. So sine and tan actually share the same zeros. They have k pi, so again, zero, pi, two pi, and three pi, and so on. Vertical asymptotes, sine and cosine have none, and of course tan has this, this one here. Now one more fun little link I like to make here is you'll notice the zeros of cosine look like this, and the vertical asymptotes of tan look like this. They're the exact same expression. And why is that? Because cosine is on the bottom. So when cosine is 0, you get a non-permissible value, which results in vertical asymptotes. So there you go. So there's lots of nice little connections you can make between the two. OK, now we're connecting this up with the trig functions uh, and transformations here. So the general transformation is going to look like this. This is for a sine curve. You could, of course, replace this with cosine or even tan if you want, but this will be fine. Um, a goes up front. B is, of course, in the argument, x minus c and d. So these are the same ones. Now there's a connection, though, here, which we would uh, need to make very clear. So when you put A out in front, of course, that's a vertical stretch. but in trigonometry, we would actually give that the name of amplitude. Trigonometric graphs get their own names, um, like amplitude and all that sort of stuff, because they quite often refer to waves. And when people talk about waves, they don't necessarily want to say a wave has a vertical stretch. It just sounds weird. OK, so when you put a B in there, you get a horizontal compression. Now, this is an interesting thing. So normally, the period is 2 pi for sine and cosine. So if you are shrinking, remember that uh, multiplies x values by 1 over b. Remember, there's that opposite effect. So the period, which is normally 2 pi, gets multiplied by 1 over b. So it becomes 2 pi over b. 
and then tan because it normally has a period of pi equals pi over b. So this is a pretty important formula here, and this one is similarly important, although you would only use it less just because tan is less common. Uh, but you would definitely want to, um, you know, not a bad idea to actually memorize that one, but take a sec to understand it as well. We're going to use this a lot more later, so we'll get some practice with that. Okay, C is the horizontal shift. That gets called a phase shift. Uh, it's just because, uh, actually, I, I don't necessarily know where the word phase comes from, but that's just what's used when we're talking about waves. Vertical shift. So uh, here's, here's a little bit of a thing. Your textbook calls it the vertical displacement. Um, I like to think of it as the height of the center line. And again, maybe that's my physics background doing that. But uh, just be aware of that, uh, the vertical shift. So if D is like the number two, that means that your graph will be at a height of two. And then we'll do all that sort of stuff, okay? So that's the height of the central line, but you could also call it the vertical displacement. Okay. So there's sort of the fire hose of information. Uh, that Most of that is there to just look back on and consult later on if you need to. Okay, so we're going to jump into our first example here. Determine the amplitude and period of each function. So uh, these aren't all the transformations possible, but these are the two that uh, they stretch it. So when we look at uh, y equals 2 cosine pi x, we can look at this. It's very simple. So the amplitude equals 2. There's nothing tricky about that one. This one here, you cannot say the period equals pi. Remember, this is like b equals pi. Therefore, you have to use the formula that period equals 2 pi over b. So that's 2 pi over pi, which is equal to 2. So the period is 2 and the amplitude is 2. So if we're going to go and sketch a graph, we're going to sketch cosine. Now we know the cosine function normally looks like if this is 1, this is negative 1. Normally cosine on, let's see, okay, oh shoot, okay, this is the annoying thing. We've got pi's up here for our domain, which is fine, but now we've got, uh, <laughs> we've got this chart here, okay. I'm going to do something here. This has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. I'm going to, I'm going to put pi right here, I guess, and I'll put 2 pi right here. That means this is negative pi, and this is negative 2 pi. Okay, so normally cosine would start at 1, it would uh, go whoop, and then go down and back up like that. It would have one period in 2 pi, except now um, we're going to have a period of 2. So up here would be 2, and down here would be negative 2. So what we're going to do is we're going to say cosine has a period of 2, and it has an amplitude of 2. So cosine is going to start up here, and now it's got to end with a period of 2. So this is a little bit of a weird thing because we've got some pi's and then we've got some whole numbers, and the two don't actually really work out super well. Remember, pi is approximately 3.14. So if we want to draw this graph, we're actually going to have to maybe get it here. Uh, on second thought, I'm going to actually, I'm going to sh sh uh, I was going to say shift. I'm going to expand this out. I need a little bit more room. I'm going to stick pi here. I'm going to, I'm going to unfortunately stick two pi off the, uh, off the end here. Okay, so I'm going to make an extra point. I think I need enough room to do that. So if I'm actually going to draw this graph, uh, I have to estimate here approximately where two is. And if this is three point one four, then two is probably right about there. This is just a ballpark sort of thing. No one cares if it's exactly perfect. So if I'm going to draw one full uh, period, I have to say that I start at two, uh, y is equal to 2, and I'm going to end at y is equal to 2. Cosine, I know, uh, drops down to negative 1, so in this case it's going to drop down to negative 2. It's going to be something like that and this would be at 1. So what the cosine graph would look like, and no one's forcing you to get this exactly perfect, it's going to cross there and there, and it's going to do something like that. It's going to cross over and then go up, and something like that. Okay, I'm just going to erase this, get this out of the way. So there is one full period of cosine with an amplitude of 2, and a period of 2. So this 
the period equals 2, and this is the terribly drawn amplitude. Okay. Now I said it should go from negative 2 pi to 2 pi, so we're just going to uh, repeat that a few times. Um, 4 is going to be somewhere around here. 2 pi is really close to 6, so 6 is going to be around here, and uh, this is going to be at 3, and then this is going to be at about 5-ish. Okay, it's, it is, of course, uh, hard to get this perfect without exactly... Uh, having, you know, just the right graph paper, but it doesn't really matter. And then the same thing over here, where I guess we're going to have like negative 2, negative 4, negative 6. And, uh, you know, this is probably more or less good enough. I'm just sort of eyeballing it here. There, there, and there. And then we're going to have a graph kind of doing this sort of thing. Okay, so if you're like me, you absolutely hate when the period is not some sort of multiple of pi. Um, and then it might continue on just like a tiny little bit. Anyway, something like that. There we go. It's uh, it's an uncomfortable feeling when you've <laughs> when you've got those weird uh, ones, twos, and threes. But say la vie. Okay, so there we go. So there's uh, there's the first one. That's a rough sketch. The second one here is going to be a little easier, I think, because I what I can see here is I can see this number here. Now this number, the amplitude equals. Now here's one thing. Actually, I should uh, I should have mentioned. You can't say the amplitude is negative one because what it is here is it, uh, it it's a distance, not a displacement. The physics people will understand the difference. This is always positive. So I'm actually going to just jump up. I'm going to make one little one little note here. When we're talking about amplitude, it's the vertical distance. So let's just add one thing for the non-physicists here. This is always positive. So in this case here, it's it's one. Now it's going to have a horizontal, sorry, a vertical reflection, so I'm going to have to be aware of that. This here, B is equal to 2, therefore the period equals 2 pi over 2, which is equal to pi. So when I go ahead and I draw this, my graph here, it will look like this. And uh, I'll put uh, I'll put one here and I'll put negative one here. So what we're doing is we're having a sine graph, but it's been vertically reflected. So normally sine would start at zero and it would work its way up. We're going to start at zero, but it's going to work its way down. So we're going to go zero, and it's going to go downward. Now before I draw that, I better plant this up. So it's got a period of pi, which means it's going to do a full up and down motion. It's going to end it. So remember, halfway in between, it's going to cross uh, here at pi over 2. It's going to cross the x-axis. It's going to have a low point here and a high point here. And it's going to go like that. So there we go. We've got one full period. And for pi, uh, instead of it uh, going up and down like sine normally does, we've got it vertically reflected. And then we can go ahead and we can draw another one. Now this one, because I have laid out the points specifically, we can actually get like some exact values. Like this is pi over 4, comma, negative 1. Uh, this one is 3 pi over 4, comma, 1, for example. And then we can go through and we can plot points here. One important thing to keep in mind with sine that maybe some people don't necessarily realize is that the horizontal spacing between the key points, like from the center line, uh, I guess the center line, to its minimum, and then from its minimum back to its center line, and then up to its maximum, and so on. Those are all the same spacing, so it's all broken up into quarters. Anyway, there we go. We've got a uh, negative sine of 2x graph. Okay, this is a similar question, except now we're dealing with vertical displacements and phase shifts. So this is pretty straightforward, I think. Here we've got a phase shift. So this is C, and this is the phase shift. And what we would say is it's a phase shift of uh, pi over 2. And, of course, it's to the left because uh, of the fact that when it's in the argument, it has that opposite effect. And, of course, the vertical displacement or uh, the 
central line, however you want to look at it, is at one. So if you're going to draw a graph like this, it's pretty easy. Um, you would start, here's one, you're actually going to draw a dotted line through to show that's where the graph is centered. And its phase shift is pi over two to the left, and we're talking about sine. So if we're using the same scaling I was using before, I'm going to have to edit these graphs so I get a, an extra bar here. Uh, we can see that the graph is actually going to start right here at pi over two comma, whoops, I went over zero, but I meant to write one. Okay, so this is kind of like the starting point. Now, if the thing about these graphs is they don't technically start anywhere because they go forever, but I like to think of this as like the starting point of my sine graph. So now I just have to give it an amplitude of one and a period of two pi. So let me just correct one thing. There should also be a negative sign right there. There we go. Okay, now I'm happy. Okay, so uh, the period is still 2 pi, which means that uh, I'm going to go all the way over here. So that is still one full period. One period equals 2 pi. Nothing's changed there. We've just shifted its phase to the left. And uh, so we break this up into one two, three, four different parts, and we can say here's the key features. So our graph is going to go up like that, going to go down like that, going to go back up like that, and so on. If we're going all the way to 2 pi, we're going to go right up there. We're going to uh, hit that high spot, and then here we're going to go down, we're going to go like that, and we're going to go like so. Cool. Okay. So there's my sign. It's been phase shifted. And again, I can sort of think of it as like, it almost like starts here. And then it ends, one period would end over there. Now, if you're looking at this going, isn't that interesting? Sign uh, with the phase shift of pi over two to the left, that looks like the cosine graph. And you're absolutely right. In fact, if you want to just say something in general, sine of x plus pi over two, equals cosine of x. That's actually a trigonometric identity, which, uh, oh, my pen's still writing. That's a trigonometric identity that we will actually look at in the next unit. So it's kind of handy to see that graphically. Okay, next one here. Um, nothing too tricky about these ones either. What we have is cos of x minus pi. So c is equal to pi. And uh, I mean, we would say like it's phase shifted to the right. And of course, the vertical uh, displacement line or the central line is equal to negative one. Okay, so graphing this, again, not uh, too darn difficult. We can see that the vertical displacement line is going to be down here at negative one. And we can see that it's phase shifted pi to the right. So here at pi, two pi. What we would do to get a good looking graph is we would uh, start the cosine graph at pi. So it's going to start. Now, here's the thing about cosine. Normally, normally cosine starts at its high point, which is one unit above its central line. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to start our cosine graph one unit above its central line at pi. So we're going to actually put a point Okay, my pen's being difficult. And it still will continue to be difficult. So this is normally where I would sit there in class and I would awkwardly try and figure out, okay, how to fix it. And I did it, so that's great. I was just thinking I could even pause the video, but it worked out. Okay, so anyway, pi comma zero, that's like the cosine starting point. Why my writing's getting extra good. Okay, so cosine, what it does is it starts high, and then after pi over 2, uh, it hits the center line, and then after a full pi, it's down low. So it's going to kind of do this sort of thing. Um, and then we can space these points out. Uh, that was the wrong place to put that point here. We can space the points out here, here, here. Here, here, and here. So it's going to kind of do this sort of thing. Like so. There we go. Ooh, I'm pretty proud of that curve, actually. So there we go. 
uh, there's our cosine graph. Um, if you're feeling especially astute, you might have even noticed cosine of x minus pi actually has the effect of vertically flipping it. So there's another rule out there. Uh, we're not going to get too worried about these right now, but just to be aware, there's all sorts of trigonometric identities because shifting a sinusoidal graph and flipping it can often have very similar effects. Okay, now let's do one where we just put it all together, and then that, I believe, will be it for this part today. Okay, so this is a nice big one here because we're going to have lots of stuff going on. I might suggest that if you are watching this video and you are willing to do some math, that you pause it and see if you can do this one before I do it. Okay, so for this one here, uh, we've got a sketch of graph and we've got a whole bunch of transformations. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna list these all out. Okay, so A equals two, B equals, um, ooh, okay, we gotta be really careful with this. Remember, if you have a number in front of the x, you have to factor it out. So make sure you do that. So b is equal to 2, c is equal to pi over 2 to the right. So I'm just going to think of it like that. And then d is equal to negative 1. a, c, and d are kind of ready to go out of the can when you open it up. Uh, you just go ahead and you drink that sweet, sweet goodness. But uh, B, you're almost never going to use as is. It's, uh, it's a raw ingredient, and you better turn it into something meaningful using the formula 2 pi over B. So what we're going to see here is we're going to see that the period is actually pi. And that's, that's way more important than knowing that uh, B, the horizontal stretch coefficient, is equal to 2. Okay, so we've got all this stuff. Now, when you go ahead and you graph, there's a few ways you can do this. One, you can kind of just, um, you can say, okay, well, sine normally, uh, so here's one and here's negative one. Sine normally does this, let me just space this out the way I've been doing it. Okay, I know sine would normally, you know, do this sort of thing and go like this, and then you can start to apply the transformations. You can also do mapping notation as well. There's a few different ways you can go about this. I'll show you both. So what you might consider doing is you might consider, um, so I guess how I, how I write it, um, two main strategies to do this. Uh, one is to apply transformations uh, to y equals sine of x. And two is in the correct order, in order. And then two is, of course, using mapping notation. So when you're using mapping notation, the only question here, mapping notation, the only question here is what are the key points? And I'll show you what those key points should actually be. So um, if you want to apply the transformations, you can, you can do it by saying, all right, so here's a, here's a regular sine graph. And it's going to go like this. It's going to have a high point there. It's going to cross zero. It's going to go down there, and it's going to come back. That would be one, one period. I don't like how I started this graph. It kind of bothers me. It's not essential. You get this perfectly. You should try and get the basic shape of it. Okay. So you can start with that. So this is y equals sine x. Uh, and then what you would do is, of course, you would apply the. You always do stretches first stretches first so then I guess you would uh, you would compress what would you what would you have you'd have a vertical expansion by two and you would have a horizontal compression by a half so in this case you'd be ignoring the period or maybe you'd just be using the period as sort of like a check um, you would do those things so you'd have to draw it uh, let's see, so compress by two and horizontally compress by a half. So I guess you're, uh, let's see, you'd have it working sort of like this. So this requires a little bit of thinking, but vertically, so it'd be twice as tall and it would be half as long. Okay, so you'd wind up having something like that. And then you can shift second. 
So if you shift second, uh, remember it's pi over two to the right, and then one down. So if you want, um, the starting point here, you move it pi over two to the right and you move it one down, so it would go over there. Um, maybe I'll switch colors for this one here. And I'll change my coloring on my words just to just to show the shift would happen second. So in green, the shift happens second. Okay, so this point is going to move like over uh, pi over two and then down by one. So it's going to go there, and every single point is going to do the same sort of thing. So it's going to wind up kind of going up like this, crossing there, and it's going to wind up going. Uh, down like that and popping up there, okay? And that's roughly what it would look like. And then you'd have to sit there and you'd have to continue. Continue along, continue along, continue along. And you could uh, just, just sort of keep doing the same sort of thing. And once you, you know, get the hang of it, it's not, uh, not too hard, really. So you notice when I'm drawing the graph, I'm always plotting uh, these points here in this order and that's because those are really the key points so when i was talking about mapping notation and the key points that's what i'm actually going to be referring to wow i totally screwed that one up let me just take one more stab at that because the spacing here uh is shrunken so it's going to look more like this there we go holy smokes i totally looked wrong okay so anyway it goes up like this and then down Okay, <laughs> do your best to make this actually look like a sine graph. It's a little hard on a digital pen sometimes, um, but there we go. Okay, if you're going to use mapping notation, let's just show how this can be done. So uh, this was kind of like, uh, this was sort of method method one, and then we'll show you method two. So key points, kep, that's not even a word. Let's move it over here to give myself lots of room to write. So um, mapping notation. So the key points on a sinusoidal graph, especially a sine graph, uh, we're going to have five key points. So when you have a graph, and I'll just redraw just a little thing over here, here, something like this. Point A is right here, point B is right here, point C is right here, point D is right here, and point E is over here. Okay, so A is the starting point of a sine graph, and that's 0, 0, and that's going to go to wherever. B is pi over 2, comma 1. C is pi, comma 0. D is 3 pi over 2, comma negative 1. And then E is 2 pi, comma 0. Okay, and these points, of, of course, would be different for cosine. So we lay out these points here. Uh, here's 2 pi, here's pi, here's 0. And of course, here's uh, pi, 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 one, negative one. So what we do is we just need the general transformation. So we can see in general, we're going to have points on x, y. They're going to go to, and now we we'll, we we'll look at all this stuff up here, and we can simply say, so what are we going to do to the, to the x values? We're going to, since b is 2, we're going to divide it by 2. And so this is going to be uh, x over 2. And we are going to move pi over 2 to the right, so we're going to add a pi over 2 to those points. Uh, then we're going to have y. Uh, it's going to be 2y because yeah, a is 2, so we're vertically stretching it by 2. And then we are going to subtract 1 because the vertical displacement d is negative 1. So if you like, we could do a mapping notation thing, and then we can work out the points a prime over here. Um, I'm going to just grab a color that's a little different here. I guess I'll use gray. So A prime uh, would go to, let's see, so pi over 2, comma, uh, negative 1. B prime. Okay, so, okay, this is all right. Pi over 2 um, is the point. So it's going to be pi over 2 over 2. So pi over 4 plus pi over 2. Okay, so uh, hold on. Pi over 4 plus pi over 2 is 3 pi over 4. So I'm just going to work that one out. 
3 pi over 4. Um, the point is going to go to 2. Uh, that's going to go to 1, I believe. This one here will be pi over 2 plus pi over 2, so that's just going to go to 2. Uh, interestingly enough, this one's not going to change. It's just going to go to pi. Uh, this one's going to go to 2, negative 1. D prime here. Okay, so holy smokes. Okay, so we're starting with the point 3 pi over 2. And we are going 3 pi over 2 over 2. So that's 3 pi over 4 plus pi over 2. What is 3 pi over 4 plus pi over 2? That's 2 pi over 4. Okay, so this is going to 5 pi over 4. And then negative 1, we're going to multiply it by 2. So it's going to negative 3. And then finally, your uh, 2 pi will be, uh, let's see, so that'll be pi plus pi over 2. So that's 3 pi over 2. Um, uh, uh, negative one. Okay, that's a little bit of math. I didn't want that in my head. I hope I worked out okay. Um, and let's just see how our mapping notation would have worked. So on my original, so I actually have my remnants of my original here in red. A would have been there, B would have been there, C would have been there, D here, and E over there. Now in gray, my points got transformed to, and let's just see if it matches up with what I did in green. So the point A prime would go to pi over two, comma negative one. So this point right here, that would be A prime, which actually matches up, because that's pi over two and negative one. Uh, B prime would be three pi over four, comma one. So this would be B prime, which is three quarters of the way to pi, so that works. Uh, C prime is pi comma negative one, so that would be this bad boy here, which works. And then I have a feeling that this is all sort of just working out. So that'd be five pi over four, and then this would be three pi over two comma negative one, so this would be E prime here. Okay, so you can do it with mapping notation, or you can do it with just kind of doing step by step by step sort of things here. Um, uh, these questions here are pretty pretty beefy, so they definitely take a little bit of time. And this uh, this thing I mentioned with the period here, we should also use that as the check. Does it look like our period is just pi? Um, is the spacing from a point here to another point here, for example, that is pi? Um, and that definitely looks like it is, it is the same spacing as like the period here, so that works out. So I'm pretty confident in green being the final answer. And uh, there we go. So I'll let you digest that for a little bit. We have uh, more. We're going to talk about going from um, graphs back to equations, but we'll save that for another video. So that will be part two. Until next time, see you later.